Hello, listeners, and welcome back to yet again another episode of the Beautiful Game podcast. As ever, I'm your host, Budge, joined by my faithful two co conspirators, Dot and Dej. Gents, how are we doing? Very well, Budge. Good, good. How about you, Dej? I'm doing great. Can't complain. Been a beautiful day so far. Looking forward to this episode. 100%. Um, and we are also joined by a very special guest. Um, Godfrey Torto, who is uh, a registered FA licensed intermediary, but to call him just that is certainly a disservice. He is most certainly a, a jack of many trades. And of course, we're going to spend the next uh, half an hour to 45 minutes just speaking a bit about what he's doing. He's a, a great role model, an inspirational figure. And what he's doing in terms of giving back to the community is something that needs to have much more light shed on it. And we're definitely going to do that and spend time doing that on our platform uh, this evening. So welcome to the platform, Godfrey. Thank you for taking out the time to, to join us and speak to us this evening. No, no, thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Appreciate the invite. And uh, I've been looking forward to it ever since, um, since you reached out to do it. So no, brilliant to be here. And you guys are doing a great job, by the way. So uh, you know, take credit for that. It's brilliant to see you guys sharing voices and allowing people to to hear from different people and then also allowing people to express themselves on this podcast. So well done to you guys and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Godfrey. And yeah, as you mentioned, we had a chat last week and we spoke about a lot of topics and there was a mm. few that really caught my eye and I obviously asked the boys if, if this could be possible and they said, yeah, they agreed. Mm. And I think, yeah, a lot of your story and the things you do is going to resonate with people and some of the insights that you're going to get into is going to, you know, serve as a good lesson for a lot of people. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, no worries. Mm. Brilliant. hundred percent. So, so just kicking things off, Godfrey, of course, just then we were speaking about the fact that, you know, you've got, you're a man with uh, many hats and, and you do yeah. a lot of things. And, and off air, we were talking about, you know, your, your day. And, the, and of course, one of the many hats you wear is that you're a father and a husband. And of course, yeah. uh, you know, everything else that comes along with that. So, you know, it, it's, it's been a very difficult time for, for everyone, you know, across the globe um, with, with everything happening uh, currently with the global pandemic and whatnot. How, how have you been keeping yourself um, occupied for, uh, from, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, listen, my day-to-day -to -day -to is very hectic at home. Um, got a big family. Um, I'm actually a father of seven uh, oh. and I've got six. My wife, with, with, my, with my wife, we actually had twins. We, we, we said we'd stop at four. <laughs> and, then, um, <laughs> and, then, and, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, two came, not one. Um, so that that is another story in itself, but we're definitely stopped now. So obviously, <laughs> with 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 what's been going on in the pandemic and stuff like that, obviously at home it's it's, it's very hectic. But what we just try and do is share uh, roles as much as possible. So you know, she has a break, and 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 also you know, I'll, I'll have a break and get over my work as well. So yeah, been been difficult times, but just try and be positive within those times as well, and um, try and use whatever time we might have to sort of focus our stuff and goals and things for the future and some of the plans that I've got with, with the work that I'm doing as well. So yeah, been difficult at times, but altogether, I would say in difficult times, you can always find positives and that's what we've tried to do. 100%, mm -hmm. 100%, well said, very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's looking at things from one perspective in terms of, of course, uh, you know, uh, your family life and whatnot. Yeah. And and uh, again, we sort of mentioned uh, it earlier on and allu alluded to it when we were sort of starting up, uh, starting up when we were talking about the fact that you are um, essentially a, a, a football agent. Um, right, yeah, yeah. And, and so how how has the the pandemic and the new way of working in the pandemic affected your your, your day to day, you know, obviously you, you, you can't meet up with your clients uh, as frequently as you would like to. Have you had to adjust your approach um, and, and your, your way of communicating uh, to accommodate uh, the, the, the changing landscape? Yeah, a lot. I mean, I think looking at work and the different things that I do. So obviously being a, a football agent and, and, and a publicist. And also running an academy um, where we help a lot of boys sort of that are maybe out of contract or boys that have been released or not been seen. It's effective work massively in that respect. And I think from the 
from an angle of being a football agent, yeah, you can't meet your clients, you can't go and watch games. Um, a lot of them, especially when things first happened and people being furloughed, you had a lot of players asking questions. The ones that are contracted, you know, and some of them being furloughed, a lot of them weren't sure about what that meant. Um, you know, are they losing out on certain money? Um, or will they get paid everything correctly? So you had a lot of queries and, and situations to sort out, especially, you know, if you've got players that are maybe in the Premier League and they're elite, that's one thing. But then if you've got a pair that's playing League Two and basically he's earning money, which isn't, which everyone seems to think in football from the outside, everyone's earning amazing money. But you've got players that maybe in League Two that are just about earning enough, just like a, a normal average job. And, you know, they may have families and mortgages to pay and they're worrying a lot about, you know, what's happening. Is the club going to be able to pay? They're hearing clubs saying that they haven't got any money. Um, or financially they're going to go bust. So you're dealing with a lot of those things day to day and those sort of queries and, you know, speaking to, you know, if you've got lawyers or financial people that you work with, try and get advice from them to try and share that with your players and just try and get them an understanding of what's really going on. So it has affected things a lot. Um, the way we've tried to manage things is to give a personal feel and keep in touch with the players as much as possible um, try and be motivational, you know, give them motivation in terms of, um, you know, future. But also, I think one big, big thing that that I saw was a, a, a difficulty was, especially when um, the season finished and players that are out of contracts, so players that maybe didn't have, uh, you know, contracts that were rolling on. That was a big worry uh, because a lot of people, as it was leading towards that summer, they were wondering, you know, there's a lot of clubs haven't got finance you know how am I going to get another club um you know they they think about money as I said if you're at the highest scale where you've been earning big money then of course you've got savings but if you're at the lower scale you may be not really saving that much and players thinking right this is my livelihood uh some of them are probably living month to month um you know where's my next contract you know is my money's going to run out can I afford to even keep my car uh you know can I keep the flat that I'm at or, you know, is another club going to come in for me? So, yeah, there was a, a number of different issues and difficulties that players faced. And as a as an agent in that respect, um, yeah, it was a difficult time. Um, but managed to kind of get through it and help most clients. But at the same time, there are still some players that don't have clubs. Do you know what I mean? And there's many good players with a lot of league, league appearances under their belt that still don't have a club. Um, mm. uh, you know, there's a lot. So definitely um, challenging times and, and just try to manage people's expectations and be honest with them as well about mm -hmm. what's going on in the situation and things they might have to do to try and survive the time that they're in. Yeah, for all of us, um, these are trying times mentally. But as you mm. mentioned, a lot of these players, their livelihoods depend on this. So what sort of conversations are you having with these mm. individuals? Mm. I think one of the most important things is to try and get as informed as possible about the situation. So I've tried to make sure that I've always kept abreast of what, what's going on. And that's what we've done as a, as, as a representation company, try to get information from financial people that we work with and legal people that we work with so we can inform the players at best. And then I think the other side of it is uh, emotionally, um, you know, trying to make sure that you can... Um, keep the players, uh, you know, try and give the players some sort of uh, place that they can feel confident about the future and about themselves and about their careers. So just try to be there for them in that respect has been a, an important part because, as I said, a lot of them are very been anxious at times about what's going on or what's the next step. Um, and then also, I think, being honest as well. Um, you know, some players have, you know, there's some one player I was dealing with that, he got offered an opportunity to what, sign at a club. And I said to him, you should sign it because the times coming up are going to be quite uncertain. And, um, you know, he, he felt that he could get better offers, et cetera, and stuff like that. And that didn't happen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, you try to give people honest advice and try to um, tell them about the true facts of the situation. Um, and then I'll tell you one thing as well. You, you, you get the flip side where sometimes some footballers can... Um, not always be realistic about their situation or, or mm. where they really are 
and sometimes their expectations of what they should be getting isn't isn't realistic. So yeah. you get some players that are really thinking, right, I'm out of contract, but I should be getting this or I should be getting that. And it's like, no, hold on. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of players that have got better CVs and more profile. They ain't got a club. So you got to be honest. Like, if you get an opportunity somewhere or something, do you know what? Take it and get playing and keep yourself in a professional game. And then from there, you never know what can happen moving up. But you've got some players that, not only just lower league players, some players even that have maybe had Premier League experience and they might have had certain offers, but they thought they were too low and they didn't want to take them. And then before you know it, they haven't got nothing. And the longer you haven't got anything, the less people are going to want to pay you anyway because you're not playing at a football club. Um, so people are looking at you saying, well, you need us more than we need you maybe because you're not really probably fit. You're not match sharp. Um, so you're trying to be honest with people from that side, from the sporting side, as well as generally being um, trying to be informative with them and give them give them some reassurance and backing and support uh, emotionally and mentally as well. Mm. Obviously, it's a case by case scenario, but roughly, mm. like, what sort of percentage of pay cuts are players having to take just to mm. remain in the professional game? Oh, it's hard to sort of be specific. As I said, I think. It, it does depend on the club, uh, like in particular, some clubs have had their budgets cut. So whereas a player might have been at a certain wage one season before, you know, their club are coming and saying, listen, we can offer you something, but, you know, it's going to have to be this or going to be that. It's hard to say specifically, but I think I think most clubs, even from Premier League down, have kind of reined in a lot on what they would be paying before. If there was a target that they had, uh, and they were looking to bring that player in, what they might have offered that player before probably might have changed to some degree. I think most clubs will probably be in that position. Obviously, there's exceptions, um, but I think that all the way through the leagues, accordingly to what their financial situation is, I think most clubs have definitely changed the way that they, um, the, the wages that they might have offered certain players before. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's definitely changed. So how do you help? you know, your clients from a mental standpoint, for mm. example, they can be on a wage where they were on, let's say X amount. And all of a sudden the club saying, look, if you want a new contract, I'm going to give you half the money. So obviously mm. mentally that must be difficult for a particular client. So how do you deal with that mental side of things? Yeah. Uh, it's a tough one. Um, it, as I said, I think it depends. I think anyone, if you're halving their money, whether you're on, I don't know, hundred grand a week, <laughs> or, 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 or if you're earning, if you're earning one grand a week, do you know what I mean? I think that it, it's relative. Anyone, I mean, obviously, if you're earning hundred grand a week or fifty, you take the fifty, but at the same time, you're still going to be cheesed about it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, I don't think in most cases clubs have probably had to cut half of most people's wages. I think, you know, you're getting maybe 20%, 30% reduction, some people 10%, do you know what I mean? But I think, um, obviously, if you're at the lower scale and, and you're getting your money reduced, then it's going to affect you a lot more um, because there's the day-to-day -day things that it's going to said you need to, you know, you've got people on the outside don't always see it, but, you know, you've got people that are earning you know, 400, 500 quid a week in some cases. Do you know what I mean? So if you're if you're cutting into that, whatever that is, it's going to affect people, especially if they've mm. got certain responsibilities. So I think, you know, with that, you just try and, um, try and kind of make people see that with football, things can change quickly. They can change for the good, or obviously it can change for the bad. So what you try and do is say, look, if you the most important thing is you've got a contract. You're playing professional football. All you can do is perform the best that you can. And if you can try and keep your, your mental together on and off the pitch and try and perform well, the reality of it is the financial situation will improve. And that will be hopefully mm. the club's finances get better. Or if you're doing well in the pitch, another bigger club's going to come and come and take you. So you try and sort of say to people that, you know, keep try and keep your focus and keep your head and try and focus on training well, performing the best that you can. And then the financially with football, as I said, things can change very quickly. One minute you could be on 500 quid a week or 700, 800 quid a week at a, a League Two club. And if you get a move to a good championship club, that can change to five grand, seven grand, eight grand a week. Do you know what I mean? Or, or more even in some cases. So I think it's just trying to keep them to, to keep their minds clear and just focused on performing well and 
and then things can change quite quickly. Mm. So how would you say the academy system has changed over the years? Obviously, you had a spell at Chelsea, you know, you mm. worked with, you know, Jody Morris, John Terry mm. at the same time they were coming through. So how would you say the academy system has changed from back then to now? Oh, it's changed so much. Um, I mean, uh, in terms of so many facets, like facilities for one, mm-hmm. most Premier League clubs now, the training grounds are completely different. Um, the environments have changed uh, in terms of there's so much, um, there's so much things that are catered to now towards giving the boys the best opportunities. And that's from, uh, you know, all of the, um, the physios, all the fitness stuff, all those different things have changed um in terms of those things you know you've got a lot more uh things that help the players achieve uh the best standards that they can um then even i think if you're talking about uh, elite levels even the level of coaching i think is in, is quite even better um you've got different influences you've got some european influences uh that have come into the elite levels as well uh which is which has helped in, in a lot of degrees so um I think the main change is just the 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 environments that like and all the different aids that players have now to help them become better. There's all the sports science and all the statistics that can you know show them you know like this is how many runs you made forward or this is the the speed that you're running at or this is the amount of kilometers that you covered and all of these things you know that you can show a player after a game to see where they can improve. Right, this is how many. How um, many assists that you made in this game? Like we've got it all stacked up there. This is the amount of shots you got off in these areas. So you, as a player, you're getting different information that can help you improve your game. Um, and I said with the sports science things like that. So from that angle, I think that's one of the biggest changes um, that players have an advantage of from, from my days when, when I was mm. at Chelsea. Yeah. Do you know what, Godfrey? I wanted to ask your your stance on um, players who are obviously UK based going abroad to further their careers. Mm. So in recent year, years, you've had high profile cases like Jaden Sancho, for example, who left city and went to Dortmund uh, recently, Damari Gray uh, left uh, Leicester and uh, has gone on to, to, to buy in Leverkusen. In like, what, what is your stance on players going abroad to, um, you know, try different cultures, different leagues, different playing styles, play in different circumstances. And does that really impact your day-to-day, um, mm. if that's the case? So, for example, in your handful of clients, mm. if you've got a player that's going abroad, how does that? How, how would that impact how you cater to that particular client or how you deal with that particular client? Yeah, I mean, good question. I think if, if we're talking about the young players going abroad, I think uh, it's good for the players to get different, it's different experiences and different coaching and different environments because I think, for one, it helps them mature as a person and then also they learn um, different things. So if you've been taught in England and then you maybe said you go to Germany, there's different things that they'll teach you to help you develop your game and understanding of football in general. So I think that that's, from that perspective, it's good. I think for the English game, in terms of obviously like the Premier League or, or uh, English leagues, of course, you like to see players getting opportunities here so that they don't always feel like they've got to go abroad. Um, but in terms of, I think, of the national team, it's probably good because you have some players that are here and you have some players that if they go to, whether it's Germany, obviously it seems like a place that a lot of English players are going to at the moment. What um, you know, there's not so much English players, for instance, going to Spain or Italy. Uh, I think Germany seem to be quite, um, in a way, being quite smart about seeing where they feel that they can tap into this new rise of English talent that's coming through. And the clubs there are pretty open and quite aggressively looking to recruit players from England where, you know, maybe the Italian clubs or Spanish clubs, you haven't really seen that um, so much. The players aren't going to those countries as, just as yet. But I think that for the national team, it's a good thing because you're getting players that are more cultured and learn different things. Uh, but for the English game, um, I just feel that uh, some of the clubs are maybe missing out on giving some of these young boys the opportunity and platforms 
to actually be in their teams. Um, you know, if you look at like the French league, okay, it isn't as strong as as the Premier League, but the young players, if you're good at 17, 18, you're in. Do you know what I mean? And you can't beat first team experience. And what happens with the English clubs, we end up buying a player from France or at 19, 20, 21, 22, but spending millions when, to be honest, we're only just across the, across the channel. There's probably players in London or in, in Manchester or whatever that have the same type of abilities, but they're not getting that chance to, to play at the 18 to 20 to, so that they get that first team development. Mm. So, um, yeah, I do feel that... I think with Brexit coming in, I think that that definitely will hopefully help some of the English players because obviously clubs can't sign players between 16 and 18 um, now really from European countries or any countries. So whereas, you know, the big clubs here would have maybe bought a, uh, uh, an under-16 player, um, going to be under-17 from a Holland or mm. a Belgium, um, now they have to think, right, we've got to find, you know, if we need to buy in a player, we need to find somebody that's at maybe a, a club in England or look into the, is there good non-league players that sit under 16, 17s that we can bring in. So I think that will hopefully give more players opportunity and that will still spin into like the under 23s or sort of like first teams where it were filtered down. So in that respect, it's, it's good um, that I feel English players get a chance, but I do think at the same time, it's good English players going aboard some mm. of them to get, get experience. No, definitely. Um, as we mentioned at the top of the show, you're a man that's got your hand in different pots and you also mm. own an academy, the yes. AG Academy, Art Scudders. Yeah. So how are you finding that at this moment in time? Because a lot of players can't play games. They can't mm. have the opportunity to showcase their talents to be able mm. to get those moves into the professional ranks. So how is that going at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's been difficult because I think even with the lockdowns, it was sort of stop and then start and then stop. And I think as academy and academy generally, we've been shut down. So uh, where we give players the opportunity to come, and that's from all levels, they come to training and then we assess them. And if there's good players, we'll try and help them get trials or we play games against other academies and clubs will invite them players on trial. Or what we do, we have a series called Be Next, which is a showcase series where we invite players they go through a preliminary stages and then we have a showcase final where we invite scouts and then they ask players and trials. So all of those things are seized. So it's been difficult in terms of we can't look at players and then for all those players that aren't in professional clubs that have been aspiring to get in, uh, you know, their kind of dreams in some ways have sort of been put on hold because, you know, they're not able to, whether it's at their semi-pro clubs, be training or come to uh, an academy such as ourselves, where we would be looking at them with the view to, is that player potentially good enough to go and trial and get signed somewhere? So it's been difficult for us, and I'm sure for a lot of the players, we get bombarded with so many questions of players that are anxious about, you know, if you're an under 16 hoping to get a scholar somewhere, you know, you're thinking, oh, are the club still going to be looking? Is, is there going to be time to still get that scholarship? Um, so, we get loads of questions and players are concerned about their futures and um, it's been a difficult time in that respect, but hopefully obviously the next few months things settle down and I'm sure there's a lot of clubs because they've not been in, able to invite a lot of players um, in either. Um, even with the last lockdown, how it was, you had some clubs that I fired London players, they weren't taking London players in because for one, they couldn't stay in digs. Uh, because obviously you can't stay with other host families and stuff like that. So a lot of clubs would just focus on local players that they could look at because they didn't want to have the hassle of, tra of people travelling and all of that. So I know there's clubs that are still looking for players um, and that's what we just try and assure the players that, look, obviously it's all going to be crammed in in a short space of time, but I'm sure there will be opportunities for players to still get signed that, so that's whether it's young players or players in under 23s, I'm sure there still will be opportunities. Yeah, because when you look at it, um, a lot of people are shedding a spotlight on the professional ranks saying, oh, this player is not getting an opportunity or this player is a free agent. But I don't really hear much talk lower down the footballing ecosystem. Do you mm. think maybe more needs to be said about this? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, 
definitely, you know, you've got some people that are campaigning, uh, you know, I saw Wabi Savage doing a lot for kind of grassroots football. And I think definitely down in the grassroots level, I think there should be more talk about, you know, how can we help kind of get everything back up and running again? A lot of clubs, semi-professional clubs are struggling financially. Um, it's a bit sad to see because there's a lot of players that uh, even in the semi-professional levels now that aren't playing football. So mm. you think take out last season that that whole half season was cut out, then this season just kind of started, and then basically the season's gone again. So you've got all these players up and down the country, um, apart you know apart from Conference Prem, uh, you know that are still playing, but you've got all these players now clubless, you know. So where they might have been playing, some of them earning a little bit of money as well. Um, some of them have got aspirations to become professionals, so they were playing games, hoping that clubs would come and watch them. It's all gone, and you know that it's a difficult thing. And I think that you know mentally trying to help those players kind of have hope still and see that it's, it's just a period of time. And obviously, yeah, while it's effective things, it doesn't mean that you still can't go and achieve things going forward. And just keeping them positive minded. Uh, is a difficult thing but I think that there should be more thought towards that and also to some of the semi-pro clubs which you listen if, if you stop semi-pro clubs it's not just going to always function at the top end it affects everything so I feel that they definitely have to put a bit more focus into that and look at ways to kind of generate uh, funds and generate support for uh, all round football because football is for everyone just because you're an elite footballer and, and maybe the clubs at the top have got great finance at the end of the day whether you're a local club or an academy like ours or, or a Sunday team or or whatever football's for everyone at all different levels and I think that mm -hmm. we have to not be so money focused on just the top end of things um, you have to look at the other part of things as well because our country in England is football's a, a massive uh, um, help and a massive factor in people's joy and keep all people in a good place of mind. So I think that, and that's at all levels. So I think that definitely that has to be looked at. Yeah, no, 100%. You know what, Godfrey, there's a question that I've, I've had on my mind for a little while that I wanted to ask mm. you, which was, um, of course, in your academy and, and, and generally in your, in your day to day, you will work with um, younger players, right? And, and, and helping mm. them along their footballing journey. Mm. How important is it to have relationships um, and, and work collaboratively with the parents of those individuals? And mm. what, what role do parents have uh, to play in, in, in their development and, and progress as well? Uh, great question. Again, I think it's massive. Um, I mean, with our academy, we sort of go from under 14s mostly. Um, and as an agent, you can only officially represent players from 16 upwards anyway, or the year of their 16th birthday. Um, you know, you can still get parents at a younger age that might ask for some advice or whatever, et cetera, but not so much professional advice in that respect. But I think a big factor, listen, if I go to myself as a, as a lad, I got scouted for Chelsea at age 12. Um, my mum loved me playing football. She she loved the fact that I played football, but from a different era, she wasn't involved in my football. So, you know, if a Sunday coach would come and say, look, picking Godfrey up at this time, she'd be like, yeah, great. But she never went to my games. Now, that wasn't because my mum didn't care. It was just because that just wasn't her mindset. Do you know what I mean? Whereas you see other players that maybe did have parents that went to the games or parents that were quite involved and supported them. You know, their paths... And they might not always be the most talented players in some respects, but their paths definitely uh, are helped and aided by having the parent support uh, helping a young player through the difficulties, through the challenges, through the times when they don't want to play, through the times when maybe they've had a bad game, through the times where maybe they've, um, you know, they might get a bit dis disheartened with football. Uh, but if you've got a parent support and parents involved in the football, and then from my perspective, speaking with parents and advising them, um, yeah, I think a parent's role is massive. I think when boys get into academies, their parents' role is important. But it's a it's such it's a big it's a big subject in itself because I think that some parents can get it quite wrong 
and affect the player's development in terms of if they're too involved and too over-possessive. And also, in some cases, you always have to uh, be realistic as well with football that it's a small percentage of players that are going to make it. Whether you find me dealing with a lot of parents, uh, some of them are massively unrealistic. Some of them, you're trying to give them honest advice about the, the realistic chance, even if your player, the son is talented, you're trying to give them honest advice about the, the the reality of them making it. But a lot of them don't want to hear honest advice. They want to hear someone, uh, if you know, blowing hot air about them and sort of saying, right, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, this, that, that. So, God, and they how, were... how, do you, how do you temper those expectations? Because it must be difficult. It's hard. Sometimes you're going to have disgruntled parents coming to you, oh, God, free, why is my son not making it into a professional football club? So yeah, how do you yeah. temper those expectations? Oh, oh mate, uh, if I could, if I got paid for telling you that, that it's a key, it's a key. <laughs> because it's so difficult. Because, you know, you have some players, parents of players of, all different levels and some players you, you know you're trying to be honest with them and say look like at this moment these are the reasons why maybe they're not so good at this and good at that and that's why he's not getting there but sometimes in their eyes it's like no but I've seen that one get there and it's like no because that 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 that's better do you know what I mean at the moment and you're you're trying to be honest with them and tell them things or it might be you know um sometimes they're at a club and it's not working out and you know, they're thinking, right, well, my son should be doing this or why aren't the club doing that? And I, what I try and do as an agent is, as I said, some people don't want to accept the honesty, but I always find that one way or the other, um, later down the line, they'll realise that I was telling them the truth. And whether that means they're still my client at the time, of course, you don't want to lose people, but I, I believe in trying to tell people the truth about things. And, you know, they will generally value it but then if not later down the line they'll realize that you know what to be fair is telling the truth and if i told you the amount of sometimes people that i've worked with that later on come back and say god feel like i'm sorry that like, or oh, we got this wrong or you know i made a mistake i should have listened to what you're saying so many parents or it's not always parents want to admit it but it does happen a lot so it's very difficult to manage expectations especially when you, in in some some angles you've got quite a lot of agents that are quite free to just lie do you know what i mean or yeah. say whatever they've got to say mm. to get the person to sign with them or mm. when a person signs say anything to try and keep the person so in an industry where oh agents do get a bit of a bad bag which i know we'll come to and that they get a bit of a bad bag which i don't always think is fair um i do think that integrity and honesty is always the best and yeah. you try and be honest as, uh, with everything as much as possible no one's saying that i'm perfect or whatever's perfect but i think it's always better to be honest with people and one way or the other they will see that honesty later on down the line whether they accept it or whether they don't want to accept it at the time they do later on so i that is my policy with it i try and manage expectations by being honest and i think that where i've got a bit of an angle where some agents they maybe not don't know football too well um i'm an agent but also for instance say i've got an academy so i can scout a player i can see if a player's a good player that's not contracted and help them so i can give players advice in terms of what i think they can do better to improve their game and and be honest with their parents about why i think certain things aren't working or you know so and then my background in pr as well so i'm able to give people a bit of a 360 in terms of um being honest and giving them the advice, I think they need to 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 do well. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, Godfrey. Um, as you mentioned, we're going to talk about agents, and we want to talk about holistically because agents get a bad rep. They're sort of seen as part of the underworld, stealing money from the game. People mm. have condescending views about agents, but from your experience, from your time working with players, mm. why do you feel agents' roles are so necessary in football? And what do you do on a day-to-day, -day, basically? Yeah, as I said, agents definitely. Generally, the name agent is kind of like, oh, like, you know, even if you're going to some young players, you know, some parents, even they hear the word agent and they get a bit scared. Or, And I think a lot of that is unfair. Um, um, you know, listen, there are bad agents out there. There are stories of things that happen. I've seen things happen in the industry myself. You get a lot of agents trying to undercut people or doing certain deals that aren't correct or 
um, you know, that that does happen a lot and not necessarily always putting the players uh, uh, the players um, best first. Mm. Yeah, best interest first. Uh, you know, often if there's a deal where there's money to be made, you know, sometimes an agent will, will try and push the deal to go for the money that they're getting paid more than necessarily what's better for the player. All of those things do happen for sure. But I do think that also an outside not everyone really realises how difficult it is being an agent either. Um, people just see the glamorous things and people maybe getting big fees or players earning. But if, you, if, you, if you're honest, and a lot of agents were honest, you know, there's a lot of people that are registered as an agent, but there's not a lot of people doing deals and making money as an agent. There's a different things, completely different. Mm. Do you know what I mean? There's loads of registered agents out there. But if you, to be honest, and, and they were to be honest, if they've made money over the last four or five years that they've been doing it, a lot of them, if they're honest, they'll probably say they're not making much money. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But a lot of them don't want to be honest about that. Some will, but I think that the perception of the general, you know, uh, person out there is, oh, agent, try and make money. Or agent, yeah, he's just trying to get a player to do this or do that. When sometimes, you know what? And a lot of the time, the player might be the one that's trying to, do that deal or the player might be one that's trying to get the money and you don't know whether the, the agent might be saying listen that's not the right thing to do but the player might be do you know what I mean but, Godfrey, are I, you saying that you, agents are sometimes almost used as pawns so the player wants something you go in front of the, the <laughs> yeah, that, that can happen. the best deal I, possible I, 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 no sometimes that listen that, that happens a lot do you know what I mean it's mm. not always the people just perceive that the agents always try to get the best this or get that or the agents only taking a pair there because they want to do that and sometimes the player saying listen I want this mate get me this or the or because the, what, what you understand some players they can be quite um um you know they'll say I want this and if you ain't doing it for them in their mind they think you ain't good enough well I want another agent players change from agents all the time so mm -hmm. if an agent's not doing this and that sometimes an agent's under pressure to try and deliver something and if the players not, if the agent's not doing it the player's giving it oh my agent I can't do that oh my agent ain't got this and all of that so I think the general perception is and I listen I'm not saying that all players are like that either don't get me wrong but I think the general perception is always that agents are out there trying to make money that You've got some agents that are just trying to earn a good, honest living. So you've got some agents that are maybe making millions, and you've got some agents also that are dealing with players at lower levels, and they're trying to get paid, get their money off the clubs and whatever, and they're just trying to just pay and make money for their families. And I think the perception always is is that all agents are doing this and doing that and just trying to do this and make money here or there without really caring about players, etc. When that is unfair and normally if something goes wrong the club or even science they'll people just blame the agent oh it's the agent's fault or the agent done this or the, or the player's gone here so the agent now the agent just wanted to do it when a lot of times it's not even true do you know what i mean um so yeah i think there's a lot of myths out there while there are a lot of things that do happen don't get me wrong but i think that a lot of people, it's an easy one to blame the agent or say the agents are doing this and that, when a lot mm. of the time it's not true. And there are a lot of agents with good integrity trying to do things the right way. Um, and I don't think that that gets shared either, which which yeah. it's it sad in a way because it, it, it makes a lot of people perceive things that aren't true. Yeah, no, 100%. Well, well said, Godfrey. Um, so, I, I mean, I mean, what I wanted to ask you just to follow on from that is that, you know, it's, it's very possible that we will have uh, parents um, li li uh, listening into this and tuning in and who will want to get their children into academies or will want to, um, you know, help their children pursue uh, a career in, in, in football. So what would you what would you give ad, as advice in terms of the guiding principles a, a 101 on selecting the right agent for 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 their their child what would you say they are the key things for them to look out for I, I would always say the first thing with your go with an individual agent or an agency the first thing is whether it's an individual and he's part of a big agency or whether it's an individual that's managing players by themselves or with one other. The first thing you want to try and build a relationship and gather whether you feel that person's honest. I feel that that's the first thing. Um, you know, like I said, no one's perfect. None of us are. But what you want to try and gather is, do you get a sense of feeling from your communications with this person and 
review, done a bit of background and checked out, do you get the feeling that this person is honest? Because without that, you ain't got nothing anyway. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And then I'll say, secondly, are they good at their work? Um, because if one person could be honest, but if they're not good at their work, <laughs> then it's all right having an honest person, but it can't really help you. So mm -hmm. I'll say those are the two first things I'll always say to any parent or any player, try and see if it's an honest person. Because some 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 players or some some players, they want to go for maybe someone that uh, they're not too focused on are they an honest person. They're just focused on does this person get the deal done or get the most money or get whatever. And at the end of the day, yeah, they might do that for you, but then there might be a deal later on down the line that they shaft you in or they do something that you wouldn't want them to do because you never really checked out that person with their integrity. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that those are the two main things that I would always advise someone before joining with an agency. Honesty and are they good at their job? As in, what is it you're particularly looking for? Are you a player that is young and you're not in a club? Or if you are in a club already and your career is going well, you know, can they enhance your career in any way? Are they going to give you good guidance with your career going forward? Um, you know, are you at a low league club that you're trying to maybe move forward? Have they got good relationships with football clubs higher up where they can obviously, um, while your performances are the most important thing, but can they highlight those performances to the clubs? Can they get people interested in you? Do they have th that sort of scope? Or does that agency have that sort of scope? Um, also, on another angle, I think some people get sucked into looking at the size of an agency rather than the individual that's going to be working mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. And I think that that's the other part as well, which is a myth. Like, you know, I, I worked at one of the biggest agencies in Europe, uh, which I mentioned, SEG at the time. And uh, that, that, that's, uh, they managed Van Persie, Vermont, and et cetera. And they went to start in England. And I sort of helped building up the, the, the South of England side of it. And the most important thing for players or parents is who is the person or individual that's going to be representing you? Yes, of course, if the company has got a lot of good connections, that can help. But some people, they'll go with an agency because they hear that it's a big agency, but then they realise the actual individual working for them can't really do that much and then they end up like kind of being upset because they thought like this agency was going to do this and that mm. but actually the individual that you've gone with to help you can't really help you so I think the biggest thing is you know I've worked with other agents for instance uh, Steve Cutner Frank Lampard's agent he was an individual but he had the same individual relationships that you as a big company might have do you know what I mean so I think you always want to look at the individual, whether they're with a big company or they're themselves and sort of um, work out what, what feeling you've got and whether they can help you. Another question I wanted to ask is, as an agent, how do you protect yourself? Because there could be an instance where you're working with a player for two, three years, you're building them up, then they just go to a bigger agency and they just leave you in the dark. Is there any way how you can secure yourself against that or is that just part and parcel of the trade? Unfortunately, it is part and parcel of the trade. Uh, I, I, it's funny, when I first got into it officially, like 12 years ago or so, I remember when um, the agency I was with, they were basically saying, yeah, you know, get, you've got to get into other players. And I remember thinking, I don't even want to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that wasn't really my nature, do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? To be like that. And I think that there's ways to build honest relationships with your players and, and potential clients where, um, you know, I think... You have to be unique. I think you have to be unique in, you know, you build play. If you get a good young player and you build a relationship with them, I think that one, you want to be honest with them, but also be unique in terms of try and find ways that you're good to them as an agent. What, what angles have you got mm. that you feel that they would want to work with you and stay with you? Of course, you've got some agencies that have been established for 20, 30, 40 like years or so, and they might have a bit of a monopoly. So they'll sometimes try and get your player. But I like to think that, if you can build good, honest relationships with your players, try and find your unique angles that you feel you can offer them services and, and offer a close relationship that others don't. Um, you like to think that as long as you're good at what you do and you build an honest relationship with them, then a lot of them will stay. Now, don't get me wrong. Listen, I, I've had experiences where I've helped players that literally have been at nothing. They've not had no club. And you've helped them and all of a sudden someone starts trying to talk to them and they're like saying they want to go here or they want to go and you're thinking hold on a minute when i first started working with you you didn't even have a club 
Do you know what I mean? So and is there contracts? Broken. Is it contracted? You have the or... contracts. Yeah. But the, the problem is now, it's a problem, but not a problem. Obviously, what 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 I think FIFA done, where before, I think you could have contracts of players for five years or even eight, seven years. But then what was happening is some agents were going to like, you know, countries, uh, you know, whether that was in certain Asian or African even countries and signing up players for long-term contracts and they're not even helping them. So then players are tied into contracts not getting help. Yeah. So what FIFA done was like, right, we're making it where there's only contracts for two years at a time. So okay. for an agent, that is good, but not good. Because obviously if you take a young pair at 16 and you start helping them and you maybe help them get in a club and then you do the work and in two years down the line, when you can actually start earning money because you don't earn money until a pair is 18, then some other agency just come and take them or you work with them for four years in some cases because some people seem to think that when a player turns 18, if that's certain clubs, the agents earn money. You don't always get fees at early stages unless you're at the big clubs or the fees are quite small. But it might take to a pair, gets, you might have them from 16 and then they get to 20 or 21 and that's when they start doing quite well and earning money. And all of a sudden at 21, you've worked with them for five years and not earned anything, hardly, or if anything at all. And then someone comes in and, because you've only got two years with them at a time, and just goes and takes them and the player's got no loyalties or whatever. And listen, it happens a lot, unfortunately, um, listen, don't get me wrong. If, if if you're a player and you're working with someone that might have helped you to a degree, but they're not really doing the work or they're not can't really take you further honestly, then all right, fair enough. But I feel that, you know, if, if I think that it comes down to players and parents' integrity. Um, listen, I've dealt with parents that have been, oh, you know, do your this, your that, you know, we did it. And then when it comes down to it, you've done the work. And all of a sudden, they're like, they know they're trying to say they don't want to do this, or they want to go somewhere else. So you get a lot of parents, to be fair, that influence the players in that way as well. Um, and then you get agents that offer players money. So you know, there's a lot of money being put around. So you know, they'll say, "Oh, look, come with us. We'll offer you this." Do you know what I mean? Or come with us. We'll give you that. So I think that I think that you know, a lot of it boils down to people's integrity. And don't get on, some people make mistakes and they realise that later one probably I shouldn't have done that or it's not a way to do things. But I think it boils down to a lot of people's integrity and morals of how they want to do things and be seen and how they want to live as well. I, I live by a code of thinking, while I'm not perfect, you know, what you put out is what you receive or what you sow is what you're going to reap. And I think that, you know, a lot of people don't think that way. So they just think about what's, what's the next best thing in their own mind or can I get this or can I get that? And I think that's the way that the world's kind of gone a lot, isn't it? So a lot of people think like that, but then later down the line, they normally end up realising that, well, do you know what? I made that choice based on wrong foundations because it doesn't always, doesn't normally work out or something goes wrong. Um, so it is something that happens a lot and it's hard to protect yourself basically apart from a two-year contract. But I like to think that, as I said, from my angle, I, I try and offer things uniquely and with, uh, with me, us as an agency, so I've just relaunched the brand AGM Sports, where we're looking to really expand. We try and really kind of uh, give people a different experience and use my PR skills as well, um, where I've worked with quite high profile names doing PR and branding and campaigns <laughs> and charitable things. Try and offer a 360 to players that makes them feel that they're getting more than just the standard agent would, would offer. Um, and, and also that personable feel that where maybe another agent that's coming in, it's about the money realistically, don't obviously where we've built a relationship with them. So there's more of a relationship there. And of course you try and make money, but you've got a relationship and an actual personal care for that player. I think that was the perfect segue to my next question um, mm. in regards to what do agents actually do? Because a lot of people see agents and think, listen, they're only there when it's time to break a deal and, Mm. you know, get this play out of this club or agree a new contract and all those mm. kind of things. But what other ancillary tasks do agents have to do? Because I was actually catching up with the FA registered intermediary last week and mm. they were like, listen, it's not just transfers. We have to make sure the players' well-being is good, making sure they're getting into to training on time and all mm. these other things. So what kind of things do you have to do as an agent to take care of your client? Great question as well. I think... <laughs> it's all based on whatever the agent's prepared to do. Like mm -hmm. you can end up being, you know, in some cases you're the agent, you're their mentor, you're their um, 
social, like mental social person, you're almost like a dad or a second dad to them. Or if they haven't got a dad, you're like that dad to them. Um, there's so many hats, like really, that people don't really realise. And don't get wrong, there are some agents, they just care about the deal. So you, you have some agents that they're really only looking at, whoa, okay, um, you know, the player's contract's running out. I'm looking to get in there now and try and move them and do the transfer, but they're not going to the player's games that much at all. Or not to say that you can, pardon me, don't get me wrong, if you've got a number of clients, you can't go to all the players' games on a regular, regular basis, but you want to try and see whether you can get to some of them. There's some agents that don't care. They're just thinking about getting the transfer, getting the next deal. So, but I think a day-to-day, you're dealing with all sorts of things. You know, some players are different. Some players want to talk to you almost every other day. And you get some players that um, that might not talk to you for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Some players might not be that bothered whether you talk to them for a month. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's different, but you get some players that every day they'll ring you about the basic things. They'll ring you about, you know, oh, you know, can I something's up happen with my car or uh, can my missus something's up with my missus? They want to talk to you about something their missus or their wife or, um, you know, just you get you get texts at one at night about something random. Um, uh, it, you know what? It, it pretty much Grocery is a free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's like sorting out basic, silly little things like that. So. It pretty much is whatever as an agency or an individual agent you're prepared to take on. Mm. It's not like a nine to five job. It's not a job where, you know, you try mm. to set certain boundaries. You do try to set certain boundaries where, all right, there's always some players that you might talk to a bit more than others. That's just based on the relationship you might build them or that they're a bit more needing of you mm. in certain respects than others. So you might give them a bit more time, but you do try to set some boundaries because like myself, I run an agency, you know, but I've got a family as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you, you, sometimes some players are ringing you at random times at night and it's not really for nothing. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> oh, you know, oh, I've got to go in tomorrow morning and they just want to have a chat. And it's like, mate, it's like it's 12 o'clock and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to watch a movie in lockdown with my wife, like tell me about a long day, kids at home, and you're just ringing me up to ask about, talk about training tomorrow morning. It's like, come on. So you do try to set some boundaries with players because I don't think, a lot of the time in players, it's, it's about themselves. So they're not thinking about, okay, do you know what? I know he's my agent, or, but, you know, they've got a life as well outside of me. Do you know what I mean? So uh, you try to set boundaries, but I think people don't realise that it's a lot of work. And, and, and realistically, unless you have what you try to get and you want to put out there as well so people understand, unless you're working with players that are doing really well, a lot of the time as an agent, you can be doing a lot of work, but you're not making a lot of money. Do you know what I mean? But people just yeah. perceive that you're doing all of that work and you're making, but it's not always like that. You know, your players have to do well. Or you have to have the high profile players. And then sometimes you, you do the extra, but often you've got people doing that work and they're not, they're not even making money, but they're doing all of that work as well. Do you know what I mean? So it's a lot, it's a lot what, what, what you're doing, but I said, it's up to each individual, how much they want to take on. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. Godfrey, as you mentioned, you work with a lot of high profile players, Van Persie, Van Malen, Nathaniel Klein, Cole on yeah. Cole. So how is it like working with those creme de la creme names? And is it yeah. a great experience? Because I've seen that you've maybe shifted from those experienced pros to a much more younger profile. Was mm. that by choice or you just didn't enjoy it anymore? Yeah. So what I would say, when I was with uh, the Dutch firm SEG, they, they individually represented Van Persie and Vermont. And I didn't represent them individually myself. Um, but I was part of the company and what they wanted to do at that time is build up getting, because they had those players, but it's mostly foreign players, they wanted to build up getting good English talent. So I kind of was the, uh, my remit was to try and get either high profile English players that are already in a Premier League or Championship or the best young talent um, that was here. So that was my remit when I was there. But separately, I had my PR company that I've had for quite a while the Arts Goddess company so that's when I was doing PR right you know I've done the Frank Lampard gold plated iPod and Colton Coles a client Nathaniel Klein from a PR perspective I work with a lot and I've done some stuff with Van Persie to, to do some a tailor that I represented on Savile Row so I've done a lot of commercial and PR work with a lot of those high profile players um, and uh, the experience of doing that's brilliant of course like you know uh, what my what my angle when I first got into doing the uh, the PR side of things was I looked at, um, I think I was about 27 at the time and I thought to myself, right, um, 
how can I work with high profile players and do things that agents weren't doing? To be honest, it was a God given mm -hmm. idea. I remember um, I thought at that age, being an agent, it's hard for me to go to those high profile players that are my age and say, well, I'm going to represent you because it's like, I feel being an agent, you do need life experience. Don't get me wrong, there's some young agents doing it. And if, if you're an eek at it, you do well, great. But I feel like you're managing someone's career and life. Do you know what I mean? So I looked at it and thought, right, it's hard for me. To, even though I knew some players that I had played with at the same age or maybe even a bit older or just a bit younger, I thought, right, but the PR and branding angle was something that at that time it was a bit new. And I thought that if I bought opportunities that agents weren't doing, that would get me working with the big names. So that's when I, I had a few good things and we'd done like a big Frank Lampard gold-plated signature iPod launch at Harrods, which he gave all these royalties to Teenage Cancer Trust Fund. And I kind of organised that deal um, with, with his agent and, and it was a brilliant thing in Teenage Cancer Trust that raised money. And from there, I started working with more players but doing things off the pitch. So I was trying to do a deal for Van Persie. It's like a fragrance deal and the deal didn't happen. But his agent was like, look, no one's running the UK part of the company. Would you be interested in doing that? And I ended up joining them. And, and as I said, that was a, a great experience doing that. Right, I still had my PR company. I was still able to do some PR things with them and with other players. And I said, Colton Cole was a client for many years, which I managed PR, but also as, a, as an agent towards the latter part of his career as well. So, yeah, I mean, working with them players is brilliant, but I feel where I've slightly diverse is when I was with the, 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 the agency because their remit was just really one of the big name players at the time I was always getting contacted by whether it was parents or whether it was like an uncle or someone or a young lad mm -hmm. would say oh listen um, my son's just got released from this club or can you look at my nephew he was at this club and I was thinking well the agency aren't interested in me signing players like that mm -hmm. um, but I know what it's like when I left Chelsea it wasn't because mm -hmm. I wasn't good enough it was because maybe I missed opportunity. I was badly informed as well. I turned down uh, a contract that they offered me stupidly because I was advised um, by a Sunday team manager to not sign it. So I thought, look, let me set up an academy that gives me the opportunity to look at players and also an opportunity for some players that aren't signed or been released because sometimes you can get released to said like me, not because of ability. It could be for a number of reasons. So that I started the academy while I was at the, the Dutch firm okay. to give myself that chance and give players a chance and it started from that and as I said and it expanded and we've had quite a few success stories where we've had quite a lot of players go to clubs not even boys that have even been signed boys that some of them have not even been in a club before and we've took them to like Newcastle Cardiff yeah. Bournemouth have signed a number of them um, you know we've, we've done a number of just took one lad that got released from Celtic and then he come to live in London He's literally living by himself and then he just, took, Leicester just took him. So we've had quite a lot of success stories. We've, we've got offered loads of opportunities. So part of the reason when I left the, the other agency, listen, the aim is always to still try and get the elite players at, at the big clubs. But a part of it was a family choice as well. What I decided was with my wife, when she's pregnant with the fourth child, it was quite a difficult pregnancy. And I decided that, listen, what I'm going to try and do for a period of time, because I try to see myself as, as uh, you know, not see myself, but I'm quite a family orientated person. I almost like set up my own academy to um, kind of create in a way my own players. So players will come and they might need, might have been released, or they might need a few edges brushed or a bit of advice of what to do. But I have managed to build up a lot of my own relationships and with, with, with clubs, whether they're Premier League, even across Europe, all the way down that if I had a player, I was able to listen. You don't, clubs don't always listen to you, but I was able to take a player maybe that doesn't have the profile or might have been released and and kind of put them in the right direction to get them to another club that maybe appreciate them. And what I just done was because of, I looked at it as, okay, for the next few years, I'm a family person. Let me try and find or create a system that allows me to not be flying around everywhere all the time and going to games and doing whatever, but I can actually find players myself mm -hmm. and try and give them the right, whether it's PR and help their profile, where I knew that they had the ability, but can I can I create something in them that makes clubs look at them and think, whoa, okay, that person's got the ability. And that's why we focused on it from that perspective. Uh, and, I, and I've managed to do that to a degree. 
And listen, obviously going forward now, as I mentioned, we've launched the new uh, a new AGM sports agency. We are focused on getting, whether it's the best talent, whether it's here or in Europe, at, at the big clubs and, and working with high-profile players. At the same time, I found that the academy is something I love doing. I love looking at giving players that opportunity and whether uh, all abilities and we'll give you honest advice. And if we find ones who think they're good enough, then that's when we go to work in terms of trying to create opportunities and platforms to get them where we feel their ability should be. And, 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 and I love doing that. And I want to take that not just from London, I'm going to take that around the country and even Africa. You know, I'm from Ghana originally and I can't tell you the amount of messages that I get from players, not just in Africa, America, Asia, saying, listen, we wish we had something like this out there or can, you, can we come to you? Can you help us? And sometimes I feel saddened because of, you want to help. Um, but it's hard to create that situation when you're here to do that. So mm. it's definitely something I want to do. I'm not just this agent in it for just trying to get all the elite players. I want to yeah. give people that have got the talent, create a platform for players that have got the talent that we can help players and people fulfill their dreams. Um, you know, and why not even have a brilliant league in Africa or whatever? It hasn't always got to be in Europe. Yeah. Everyone's always trying to come to Europe, Europe, Europe. That's one of my dreams and visions that we can create opportunities that, Yes, we can help players come to Europe, but eventually, why can't the best league be in Africa? Why can't, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Why is everyone in Africa always got to want to feel they've got to come out of Africa? Why, do you know what I'm saying? So those are the bigger visions. That I'm going somewhere else with it, but those are the things that I want to do. Uh, I love helping people. I love giving, helping people achieve the best that they can. And obviously, yes, you want to make your money, and, and, and that's important. Of course, you've got to do that, but at the same time, you know, you want to do it also giving something to help people as well because that's what builds legacies right definitely yeah 100 yeah. you know what godfrey there's no better way for us to draw th this uh, conversation to a close than, than what you just mentioned there mm. in terms of the, the you know the visions and, and the ambitions that you have and and i mean if so many more people were like-minded and, mm. and and had similar visions and, and could pull resources and um and expertise together that isn't something that is, you know, that, that's that out is out of the realms of possibility, is it? Really, mm -hmm. um, man, it's, it's it's honestly been an absolute pleasure to to spend this time and speak to you and hear, you know, uh, so much about what what you do from a day to day perspective and and how you're, you know, giving back to the community is honestly so inspiring. Um, and, and, and all we can ask is that you continue to do so, man, because certainly from from you know our, our background and where we come from and in in our culture. There are so few role models and people that are like yourself that are giving back and 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 you know trailblazing and and setting the example for for you know so many young people to follow. So honestly, we, we thank, thank you, you so much for your thank time. You. We thank you for your your that example. Was a great insight. Great, yeah. great insight. Thank you, Godfrey. I appreciate it. Now I can't thank you guys enough for inviting me on and having a platform to share. Um, yeah, listen, as I said, you guys carry on doing what you're doing. It's inspirational. Um, to see what you're doing and, and you're doing a great job with it and, uh, and I hope it gets bigger and bigger and the audiences get bigger and bigger and you're able to share uh, more wisdom and, and give people the opportunity like myself to talk so thank you very much thank you Godfrey. thank you much appreciate it Godfrey there. gonna no leave worries. it there hopefully next time yes. we do it we can we can do it in person and and, yes. and enjoy pleasantries over a, a plate of banku or something oh yeah <laughs> 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 hey, wait, wait, who's gonna make it though who's gonna make it <laughs> 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 uh, we're gonna leave it there guys thank All you right, very much for, for, thank you very much for tuning in um, catch us uh, on Twitter at podcast underscore TBG, on Instagram at pod underscore TBG, on YouTube, the Beautiful Game Podcast. And until the next episode, over and out. Peace. Yeah.